Welcome to TSX Quarterly, the podcast that brings you publicly available earnings calls from companies listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange in one convenient location. Gone are the days of looking through confusing websites. You'll find the important information right here. Enjoy the call. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for standing by. Welcome to KP Tissue for quarter 2021 results conference call. At this time, all participants are, are in a lesson only mode. Following the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. Instruction will be provided at that time for you to queue up for questions. If anyone has any difficulties during the conference, please press star followed by zero for further assistance at any time. Before turning the meeting over to management, I would like to remind everyone that this conference call is being recorded on Friday, November 12th, 2021. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mike Baltzera, Director, Investor Relation. Please go ahead. Thank you, Operator, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mike Baltzera. I'm the Director of Investor Relation at KP Tissue, Inc. The purpose of this conference call is to review the financial results for the third quarter of 2021 for Kruger Products LP which I'll refer to as KPLP going forward. With me this morning is Dino Bianco, the Chief Executive Officer of KP Tissue and Kruger Products LP, and Mark Holbrook, the Chief Financial Officer of KP Tissue and Kruger Products LP. The following discussions and responses to questions contain forward-looking statements concerning the company's activities. Forward-looking statements involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties, which could cause the company's actual results to differ materially from those in the forward-looking statements. Investors are cautioned not to rely on these forward-looking statements. The company does not undertake to update these forward-looking statements except if required by applicable laws. There is a page at the beginning of the written presentation which contains the usual legal cautions, including as to forward-looking information, which you should be aware of. I'd like to point out that all figures expressed in today's call are in Canadian dollars unless otherwise stated. The press release reporting our Q3 2021 results were published this morning and will be accessible from our website at kptissueinc.com. Please be aware that our MDNA will be posted on the website and will also be available on CDAR. Finally, I'd ask that you during the call to refer to the presentation we have prepared to accompany these discussions, which is also available on our website. We'd also appreciate that during the Q&A period for you to limit your questions to two. Thank you for your collaboration. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll now turn the call over to Dino Bianco, our CEO. Dino? Thank you, Mike. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our third quarter earnings call. We are pleased with our third quarter results despite a macro environment that is impacted by COVID, inflation pressures, and supply chain disruptions. On the COVID front, we are seeing a near normal return to pre-pandemic demand after a first half inventory deload across the system. We're also seeing recovery in away from home markets and pockets of elevated consumer demand in the U.S. On the inflation front, we are beginning to see the impact of escalated costs across our whole business system. This is particularly evident in costs such as sorted office paper, packaging, freight, and energy. On the supply chain disruption side, we have not seen any major impacts to our raw materials at this point, but continue to monitor the situation closely. One area that we have seen some impact on is securing freight carriers, particularly in the Southeast United States. This has resulted in increased costs and some delayed deliveries. One last area I will talk about later is the impact of labor shortages. This is an issue across all industries and has had the greatest impact in our Memphis facility. Given this environment, we remain agile and flexible to respond to the changing landscape to ensure we continue to grow and deliver strong performance. We are building contingency plans, including additional pricing and cost reductions to mitigate any costs. With that context, let's now turn our attention to the numbers on slide five. Our revenue growth of 6% for the third quarter of 2021 reflects the benefit of our pricing action in our Canadian consumer segment, combined with higher sales volume. In the way from home business, we saw gradual improving commercial end markets and the benefits of a successful execution of a recovery plan. 
Revenue is also up 15.3% on a sequential basis versus Q2. Canadian revenues increased 4.6% from the same period last year, while the U.S. improved 8.3%. We had some negative uh, FX impact on the U.S. sales, and in constant currency, the increase was actually 14.4%. This strong performance reflects the faster recovery of our U.S. away from home business, and also a relatively weaker quarter last year during the pandemic. Our adjusted EBITDA was down 12.8% compared to the same period last year due to the impact of higher inflationary costs and near record pulp prices. With the benefits of the Canadian pricing action, adjusted EBITDA improved sequentially to 40.3 million versus Q2 of 2021. Pulp and BEK have remained at near peak levels and their rise has been quite dramatic over the last year, as you can see on page six. Third quarter NBSK average prices in Canadian dollars increased 29% versus prior year, while BEK average prices rose 42% compared to prior year. For the balance of the year and heading into 2022, we expect NBSK and BEK prices to remain elevated. Also impacting our fiber costs and not reflected on this chart is sorted office paper, which has seen a greater than 100% increase over 2020. In terms of our network on slides 7 and 8, the paper machine and converting ramp up at Tad Sherba continues to stay ahead of our startup plan. In fact, it recently hit our substantial completion hurdle as a commercial facility. In June, we announced additional investments of $25 million in Sherbrooke for an artificial intelligence project with $6.7 million to be contributed by both levels of government. This will bring our total investments at that site to over $600 million. This project consists of creating and implementing a digital twin of the entire plant supply chain. The virtual supply chain model will be using real-time data augmented by predictive and prescriptive AI capabilities to improve the plant's overall performance. This should help us serve our customers and consumers more efficiently than ever. It will also raise the capability of our state-of-the-art facility and provide us learnings to roll out AI to other facilities. We have already begun to see strong benefits from the first phase of our AI program at this early stage. As for our Sherbrooke expansion, we are currently finalizing the project scope Engineering, environmental, and geotechnical studies are progressing well. We are focused on finalizing the scope to ensure this new facility and its assets will meet our future growth needs across all our segments and is synergistic with our existing network. Moving on to the next slide. In Memphis, as indicated before, we are investing more than $20 million in the new facial tissue line that will allow us to produce both TAD and conventional products. This project is progressing well, however, recent supply chain impacts on this equipment may slightly delay our startup. Once operational, this new line combined with the new Sherbrooke facial line will increase our North American capacity and improve our position in this category. Let me move on to the OPEX program. Our waste reduction initiatives are showing positive results in most of our sites. We are also pleased to report that overall equipment efficiency is showing an upward trend. That being said, beginning in late the second quarter of 2021, we began to see labor shortages in our Memphis plant that have affected productivity and resulted in increased incremental costs in the third quarter. These labor challenges are not unique to us and we expect this labor issue will persist into the fourth quarter. We are establishing several measures to mitigate its impact. Our ability to support Memphis with our other plants is a testament to the strength of, of our North American network and continued investment for long-term growth. The goal with all our network investments is to deliver improved product capability, capacity, and cost efficiencies in both conventional and premium tissue segments in North America. Let me move on to slide nine. We continue to focus on building the equity of our brands with increased marketing investments. This, in turn, has helped drive market share gains. In short, we are extremely pleased by the overall performance of our brands in all categories since 2019. Our unapologetically human campaign employing purpose-driven messaging continues to be recognized worldwide with 17 awards in total. In early October, we had our 18th annual Cashmere Collection Fashion Show, 
The collection made of sheets of cashmere bathroom tissue served as the annual kickoff to the October Breast Cancer Month. This year, the event was a huge success with an in-person audience. The marketing reach was further extended with the first ever 30-minute special aired prime time on the CTV network. More recently, the successful launch of SpongeTowel's Ultra Pro, based on very strong six-month trial and the addition of new category users, has led to further share momentum in towels. This Made in Canada Ultra Premium product is ahead of our plan on all metrics, including revenue, share, distribution, and trial. Like many other companies, we are seeing strong growth in e-commerce. We have added additional resources to capitalize on the shift, and year-to-date our e-commerce sales have increased over 80% versus the previous year. We also have been working on new on-trend innovations that will be ready for launch in the first quarter of 2022, which I'll speak about at our next earnings call. The data presented on slides 10 and 11 is from Nielsen. It shows solid market share performance over a 52-week period ending on October 9, 2021. Our stable supply position, our innovation, strong customer partnerships, and continued marketing are all factors that supported our strong overall market share gains. With a combined 35.6 share, our Cashmere and Purex brands are the leaders in the bathroom tissue category. Looking back since 2019, this represents an increase of 2.4 share points. During the same period, we achieved notable growth in facial tissue, reporting a 35.5 share or an increase of share, uh, four share points. Scotty's has strengthened its position and is the clear number one with many Canadian consumers who consider the brand synonymous with facial tissue. As previously noted, we also po- posted solid market share gains in the paper towel category. Since the beginning of 2020, our share has increased by 2.6 points to reach 23.2%. This was driven by strong marketing and sales execution across our entire sponge towels lineup, and we will continue to make further investments in this category. On page 12, Away From Home delivered positive adjusted EBITDA as the business is progressing across various areas and benefiting from a faster recovery in the U.S. market. We estimate the volume remains approximately 10% lower than pre-COVID levels compared to the same quarter in 2019. We are also witnessing the benefits in away from home from increased in-house paper production, which translates into lower costs and higher quality. This combined with improved volume, higher asset utilization, and cost reduction initiatives led to strong results for the third quarter. And to offset overall inflation costs, we've also implemented a new price increase in away from home that will be effective in January 2022. The benefits will fall through the P&L with contract renewals beginning in Q1 2022. I will now turn the call over to Mark. Thank you, Dino, and good morning, everyone. Please turn to slide 13 for a summary of our financial performance for Q3 2021. Revenue was up 6% to $391.4 million in the third quarter of 2021 from $369.1 million for the same period last year. On a sequential basis, revenue was up 15.3% from $339.3 million. Adjusted EBITDA decreased 12.8% to $40.3 million in Q3 2021 from $46.2 million in Q3 last year, but increased 8% sequentially from $37.3 million in Q2 of 2021. From a margin perspective, adjusted EBITDA amounted to 10.3% in Q3 2021 compared to 12.5% in Q3 last year and 11% in Q2 of 2021. In the third quarter, there was a net loss of $9.3 million compared to net income of $18.5 million for the same period last year. The decrease can be attributed primarily to lower adjusted EBITDA a foreign exchange loss on U.S. denominated debt, and higher depreciation and interest expenses. These items were partially offset by a higher income tax recovery. In the quarterly segmented view on slide 14, consumer revenue increased 3.9% year-over-year and 13.7% sequentially 
to 332.4 million in the third quarter of 2021. In the away from home segment, revenue grew 19.9% year over year and 25.5% sequentially to 59 million. Consumer adjusted EBITDA amounted to 39.1 million in the third quarter of 2021 compared to 55.3 million in Q3 2020, while adjusted EBITDA margin was 11.8% and 17% for those same periods respectively. Sequentially, consumer adjusted EBITDA was slightly lower by 1.2 million with the margin two percentage points lower. For the AFH segment, adjusted EBITDA improved by 2.2 million in the third quarter compared to minus 3.5 million in Q3 2020 and minus 0.4 million in Q2 2021. It's important to note the favorable impact of the release of a COVID-19 related accounts receivable provision of 1.3 million in Q3 2021 for AFH that was originally recorded in 2020. Excluding that one time item, AFH results were still in positive territory and at a much higher level compared to last year and sequentially. Corporate and other costs amounted to 1 million in Q3 2021 compared to 5.6 million for the same period last year, which included startup costs for the TAD project. On slide 15, we review the year over year revenue growth for Q3, which was 22.3 million or 6%. This increase can be attributed to a selling price increase in Consumer Canada slightly higher sales volume in the consumer segment, and a pickup in demand in the AFH business, resulting from the easing of COVID-19 restrictions. These factors were partially offset by a negative foreign exchange impact on U.S. sales. From a geographical basis, revenues in Canada improved 10.3 million or 4.6% year over year, while U.S. revenues grew by 12 million or 8.3%, and in constant currency, U.S. revenue increased by 14.4%. On slide 16, we provide further insight into our Q3 2021 adjusted EBITDA, which decreased year over year by 5.9 million or 12.8% to 40.3 million. In terms of adjusted EBITDA margin, it was 10.3% in Q3 compared to 12.5% in Q3 2020. The decrease in adjusted EBITDA was primarily driven by an unfavorable sales mix, higher pulp prices, labor shortages at our manufacturing plant in Memphis, and inflationary pressure, as well as higher freight rates and warehousing costs. These factors were partially offset by more insourcing activity for the away from home segment and net favorable FX impact and lower SG&A expenses. Now let's turn to slide 17, where we compare Q3 2021 to Q2 2021 revenue. Sequentially, revenue increased by 52.1 million or 15.3%. This quarter over quarter growth was driven by higher consumer and away from home sales volume in the United States and Canada, and the benefits of pricing actions in Consumer Canada and the positive impact on US sales of FX. In terms of geography, revenue in Canada increased by 14.3 million or 6.5%, while revenue in the US grew by 37.8 million or 31.5%. On a constant currency basis, US revenue increased by 28.2%. This significant increase in US revenue was due to a higher inventory deload in Q2 2021 and a consumer and customer reload in Q3 due to the Delta variant in the US. On slide 18, Q3 2021 adjusted EBITDA increased sequentially by $3 million or 8% from Q2. The increase in adjusted EBITDA was mainly due to higher sales volume in the consumer and away from home segments, as well as the selling price increase in Consumer Canada, which took effect in Q3. These factors were partially offset by higher pulp prices and inflation on manufacturing costs, fixed cost absorption as we reduced our inventory, a net unfavorable impact from FX, increased freight and higher SG&A expenses. 
In terms of adjusted EBITDA margin, it was 10.3% in Q3 compared to 11% in the previous quarter. I'll now turn to our balance sheet and financial position on slide 19. Our cash position stood at $118.6 million at the end of Q3 2021 versus $129.7 million at the end of Q2. The $11.1 million cash decrease was mainly due to repayments on the senior credit facility. Overall net debt at quarter end stood at $835.7 million, up slightly by $8.1 million from the end of Q2. The variation reflects higher FX on U.S. debt. Overall, our net debt to trailing 12 months adjusted EBITDA leverage ratio increased to 5.5 times in Q3 2021 compared to 5.3 times in Q2. The, this increase was primarily due to the slightly higher level of net debt and a lower trailing 12 month adjusted EBITDA. At quarter end, total liquidity representing cash and cash equivalents and availability from the revolving credit agreements was a healthy $273.6 million. In addition, there was $25.5 million in cash set aside in the Tad Sherbrook entity and $24.8 million of cash was held by KPSB and available for the Tad Sherbrooke, sorry, the Sherbrooke expansion project at the end of Q3. I will conclude my section by reviewing the CapEx on slide 20. Year-to-date 2021 CapEx amounted to $109.1 million, including $88.9 million for Tad Sherbrooke, of which $5.5 million consisted of accrued and unpaid capital spending as of the end of September. We expect Tad Sherbrooke CapEx to total approximately $100 million for 2021. Subsequent to the quarter end, the Tad Sherbrooke project achieved substantial completion from a lender perspective, which also provides a reduced interest rate on the debt going forward as of November 1st. Remaining CapEx, including the new AI project and the Sherbrooke expansion project, is expected to be in the $40 to $50 million range. That puts total CapEx for 2021 in the range of $140 million to $150 million. Thank you for joining us this morning, and I'll now turn the call back over to Dino. Thanks, Mark. Turning to slide 21, climate change and climate action is one of the most important issues facing the world today. For our part, we are fully engaged towards achieving sustainable development. In fact, one of the key pillars of our program is Planet Positive. We have a bold and long-term commitment throughout multiple dimensions of our business and our culture to deliver against our goals. Sustainability is not only part of our business plan, but part of our purpose as a company. I want to conclude with slide 22. To offset widespread inflationary costs, we have taken additional pricing actions. During the third quarter, we began to see benefits from our price increase in Canada consumer with the full impact beginning in Q4. Our U.S. consumer business has also implemented pricing, which will be begin to flow to P&L in 2022. On the away from home side, we have implemented further price increases to counter inflationary pressures, which will also begin to flow through in Q1 2022. In terms of our brands, we continue to invest in innovation to build share in Canada, while expanding the brand name, recognition, and reach of White Cloud in the U.S. Turning to our TAD facility in Sherbrooke, we're exceeding the ramp up curve initially established for bathroom tissue and paper towels, including the manufacturing of our new Sponge Towels Ultra Pro product. Being ahead of schedule will enable us to meet upcoming volume requirements as we secure new customers and grow our existing customer base. Our operational excellence program, Memphis Facial Line Expansion and Sherbrooke Expansion will increase our volume capacity and optimize our cost structure for the future. The away from home segment is well positioned for a recovery in end user markets and will gradually benefit from price increases and cost management. As previously stated, we're fully committed to reimagine 2030, our new sustainability plan. We are firm believers that our plan will spearhead transformative growth, growth and sustainable innovation. And we continue to develop our organizational capability and culture to drive future growth. 
Now turning our attention to our outlook for Q4. We are seeing activities and customer behavior starting to return to pre-COVID levels in both business segments. However, cost inflation and lag pricing in the fourth quarter are expected to impact results. Q4 2021 adjusted EBITDA, therefore, is expected to be in the range of Q3 2021 and Q4 2020. I would like to close by saying that despite the current industry cost and volume impacts, our long-term outlook for the business remains healthy and our growth strategy remains unchanged. The gap between higher costs and price increases is a timing issue and not a permanent step down in margins. We fully expect to reap the benefits of our network modernization efforts, volume capacity ramp up, new product introductions, strong customer relationships, and marketing marketing initiatives to deliver growth and create value for shareholders in 2022 and beyond. Finally, I would like to thank our employees for their ongoing resilience and determination to stay safe and make our company great, especially during the challenges of COVID. We will now be happy to take your questions. Thank you. At this time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Your first question comes from Roshni Lutra from CIBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Good morning. Uh, Dino, can you quantify the level of pricing action you're taking in both the consumer and away-from-home segment? Today's customers expect fast, personalized support. Intercom has the tools you need to deliver just that, efficiently, at any scale. Supercharge your team's productivity and make your customers super happy with Intercom. Learn more at intercom.com slash support. At T-Mobile for Business, unconventional thinking means we see things differently so you can focus on what matters most. That's why we've become the leader in 5G, number one in customer satisfaction, and a partner who includes 5G in every plan, so you get it all. Unconventional thinking is better for business. Open Signal awards T-Mobile as America's fastest 5G network USA. 5G user experience report July 2021. Capable device required. Coverage not available in some areas. Some uses may require certain plan or features. See T-Mobile.com. For J.D. Power 2020 award information, visit jdpower.com slash awards. I will tell you, uh, I won't give you an amount, but I will tell you it's uh, the new increases that are going to go out uh, for U.S. consumer and for AFH, which are the new increases. Canada, as you know, priced uh, effective July, Canada consumer. They will be in the uh, high uh, single-digit amount. We have uh, those price increases will have uh, reflected uh, our pulp estimates plus all the the best uh, position we have on inflation. So um, uh, we should be in a... Uh, despite the lag, we, you know, we should be in a margin neutral position with pricing and cost once the pricing kicks in. Okay, thanks. And then um, just how's the uh, expansion of White Cloud in, uh, in the U.S. progressing? Uh, I would say uh, we are above 2019 levels, but not at uh, 2020 levels. Obviously, in 2020, with the pandemic, we had a lot of doors open uh, for us uh, because of supply issues, so we were able to, to move uh, White Cloud in. We've retained uh, many of those. Some, some we didn't. Some were more uh, in and out. Uh, but we continue to build the brand and invest uh, in the brand. Uh, in fact, um, it's probably something I'll talk about in, uh, in future uh, earnings calls about uh, what we're doing with the White Cloud brand in the U.S. Uh, it is part of our growth strategy for the future. And, uh, you know, with the addition of our, our network and our assets and our capability, uh, it'll be a benefactor from that additional uh, capacity. Okay. Uh, thanks. And then just the last one for me. Um, are, are you able to give us, like, an initial CapEx guide for 2022? I'm sorry. I didn't hear the first part of that question. Guide? Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering if you could give us, like, a preliminary CapEx guide for 2022. Oh, CapEx. CapEx guide. Yeah, we generally don't provide that uh, at this point. You said capex, I assume, right? Yeah, yeah. I would, I would, I would use, you know, for non-strategic, uh, probably in the same range that we have been investing this year, give or take. We haven't finalized our budgets yet, so. Okay, uh, that is all I have. Thanks so much. Good luck next quarter. Thank you. 
Your yeah, next question comes from Sean Stewart from PD Securities. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. A um, couple questions. Morning, Sean. Good morning. Uh, the labor situation in Memphis, and you, you touched on your, your mitigation efforts. Is that just rolling out these automation initiatives? Are you paying more? Any more detail you can give us on, on how you're mitigating the, uh, the pressure there? Uh, yes, yes, and yes. You know, I would, I would say we're, we're in a new world, as you know, Sean. It's not just our, our business, it's all, all businesses post-COVID, and, and the demand for labor is incredible, and there's pockets of it that are hit a little harder. Memphis definitely has hit harder for us. Uh, it has always been a, a, a challenge uh, for labor availability, and it's been spiked uh, because of uh, various factors. Uh, so we're being very creative. Uh, automation is part of it, for sure. So we're looking at investing in automation. Um, hiring, retention, uh, you know, bonuses, uh, looking at our pay grades, looking at uh, strengthening our, our purpose and our non-comp uh, uh, sort of benefits uh, in, in that region. Uh, so we're, you know, we've approached this with an open book and, and trying to be very creative because you know, it certainly hit us in Q3. We think it'll hit us in Q4. It'll gradually improve as we move through, but this won't be something that turns overnight. Uh, I think the uh, the labor challenges for many companies are going to persist for, for quite some time. Okay, thanks for that detail. And, and Dino, you, you mentioned the, the strong year-over-year -year growth in your, your e-commerce business. I would guess that's still a pretty small percentage of the overall mix. Can, can you give us context on whether it's sales or shipments, what, what percentage goes into that channel now and, and where you can envision that share growing to over time? Yeah, sure. It's, it's a bit imperfect data, uh, Sean, uh, but our, our, our guess is that 5% of our volume is going through uh, e-com. And the reason why it's imperfect data is because you don't always see from bricks and mortar companies that, that are, have their e-com wing or their arm you don't always get the clear data. You know, for other companies that are pure e-com, like Amazon, it's a little easier. Um, so we think we're about 5% of our sales, obviously uh, almost doubled uh, versus where it was, as, as you see in the market for everybody. We do think it's going to plateau, uh, you know, po post the COVID. Uh, so I don't, I, don't expect the, I don't expect it to retract substantially, but I don't expect the same growth curves that you, you've seen. Uh, so... We're, we're targeting probably in the high single digit in the next couple of years, so 8 and 9% probably is, is what we think e-commerce will be for us. And part of our e-commerce strategy, I, don't talk, I didn't talk about it on the chart, I mean, um, you know, certainly there's, there's, the, there's the whole uh, path to purchase for the consumer. How do we engage them before they get to e-com? How do we highlight and talk about our brands? Uh, you know, the, the, the descriptive, the quality of the, of the photography, the uh, pack sizes, you know, our products were mainly designed to sit on a grocery shelf, and e-com is a different uh, is a different configuration requirement. So it's a whole business system. Even though it's easy to quote, you know, we're we're up 100 percent. There's a lot going on there to drive sustainable growth for the future. That's uh, that's useful detail. Okay, uh, thanks very much. That's all I have, guys. Thanks. Your next question comes from Paul Quinn from RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, morning, guys. Uh, just uh, following up on Sean's e-commerce question, that, that 5%, what, what's the split between e-commerce for, for KPT and e-commerce for, for others like Amazon? Well, the 5%, good morning, Paul. The 5% is, is our Canadian branded sales that we believe go through an e-commerce channel, whether it's an Amazon or bricks and mortar. We don't have, I don't have, it, I don't have the split in front of me. Obviously, Amazon is a big, probably it is the biggest player still in that in that segment. But it is all our channels. It's Costco, it's it's Loblaws, it's Walmart, it's Sobeys, Metro, uh, you name it. They're, so so it represents all of Amazon would be one of the larger ones, and uh, as it is in the marketplace. But others are quickly catching up. You see a lot of investment from our bricks and mortar companies that have really stepped up their e-commerce efforts. So we're seeing aggressive growth across all our customers. Okay, so just so I understand, you guys aren't 
selling it through your e-commerce channel directly. No, no. You're selling it to customers uh, who are selling yes. it through e-commerce. Yes. Okay. Yes, Paul. Yes, we 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 are not going direct to consumer. We're working through our customer base. Sometimes they're dedicated warehouse. Sometimes they're shared warehouses. So. Uh, uh, you know, that's why I say it's in perfect data because sometimes it's hard to track exactly what went through an e-com versus a, a cash register. Yeah, no, I understand that. I just wonder, why wouldn't you go direct to consumer on e-commerce? Uh, I think at this point, uh, you know, we've, we, we have strong customer partnerships. They have infrastructure already built in place. They are, de they are a consolidator of other products. And, you know, when you're going on e-com, you're not just buying tissue. Uh, so the business model works for us right now. Will we someday get into it? Maybe, but at this point, we don't we don't see a need to have to get into it. We feel our needs are being well served by our existing customer base uh, through Econ. Okay, and then just uh, you made that comment on Pulp that you expect it to be elevated uh, through 2022. What does elevated mean to you guys? Yeah. I, I think the uh, the crystal balls are a little dusty for for forecasting anything these days. Uh, you know, we see it kind of moving sideways to slightly down, but we don't see a dramatic change. If you look at past pulp cycles, you had rapid increases, rapid decreases. I think this pulp cycle will be different. Rapid increase and probably uh, a lot of sideways motions um, are going down. You've got obviously COVID as a factor, still the recovery. You've got supply chain factor. You've got, you got countries like China, you know, uh, uh, curtailing a lot of industry. You've got new facilities in South America that are going to produce eucalyptus, so that's uh, you know obviously that's a, a, a bullish aspect. So there's a lot of dynamics in the marketplace right now. So our best call is that it'll likely go sideways on a slight decline, but other inflation costs will will continue to rise. Uh, so it'll keep pressure on our total cost basket. Uh, and as I said in my comments. Any company that's operating in this world, uh, this market today, just has to be ready to pivot as things change. You know, you don't play, put the playbook and move with it. You got to be ready to move, and if, if costs decrease significantly or increase significantly, uh, we got to be ready to uh, to move. Okay, um, and then just on, uh, I guess the away from home section section on on page fourteen, there you've got a negative uh, three point seven percent margin. I think that should be positive three point seven. That's the first positive we've seen since uh, Q1 of 18. Just wonder why, uh, just trying to understand that, that 1.3 million uh, one-timer in the, in the quarter that, that, uh, that helped you out. What, what is that related to again? Uh, hi, Paul. It's Mark. Um, we had a uh, accounts receivable provision that we set up in 2020 during COVID-19 as a, uh, because of the situation with the away from home market um, and as the mar uh, market has recovered for away from home we released that provision in q3 we didn't uh, need that any longer so that's what that 1.3 million is for so okay. one time and then, uh, right one timer okay and then just uh, overall i mean uh, you know you're talking about the 600 million you're you're investing in sherbrooke and i'm just looking at your guidance which is you know pretty muted for q4 here just wondering when you expect a big ramp up of of, uh, of of cash flow and results to come back from that, uh, you know, from these investments in Sherbrooke. Yeah, I think uh, the ramp up, uh, as I've mentioned, has been uh, ahead of schedule. Uh, I, I think, the, as you say, the, the muted results for Q4 is more, uh, it's not a volume driven issue, it's more of a margin catch up issue. Our volume will continue to be strong, uh, as we see, and that's a lot of it's just uh, the market's turning around plus the added capacity we, we have from. Sure, but so we're already starting to see those benefits, and we expect uh, to continue to grow in 2022. Uh, the margin, the margin structure in Q4 is, is dealing with the lag between costs and, and pricing, if you will, uh, that uh, that we don't see as, as being sustained uh, into 2022. All right. Um, thanks for that. Best of luck. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. Your next question comes from Zachary Evershed from National Bank Financial. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking my question. Good morning, Zach. Good morning, Zach. Uh, so with inflation in raw materials and labor 
pretty much across the board. Are you concerned at all about budget overflows on the Sherbrooke expansion? No, but you said budget overflows? That's right. You, are you talking about capital or are you talking about profit? What are you talking uh, Sorry, Paul, just, or Zach, just a little clarity. Yeah, on the Sherbrooke expansion, the $240 million oh, project. This, this, yeah, there is, there is some inflation. You know, anybody, uh, obviously, who's uh, putting in equipment, uh, we, if you remember, that project had three stages. It had a, a, a bath line, a facial line, and a paper machine. Uh, I think where our biggest concern around some inflation will be around the, the paper machine. It's the last one that comes on board. Uh, and the procurement process is really starting now. I feel on the bath tissue line, we're good. A little bit of inflation relative to our plan on, on the facial line, since that's the second piece to come in and is starting to see some inflation, and then the pa uh, and then the paper machine. I would say it would it doesn't change the economics dramatically. Uh, I don't have a final number, but I know we put a provision in for uh, incremental inflation costs. Uh, with that project. Perfect, thanks. And could you tell us a little bit more about the investment in automation and artificial intelligence? Yeah, I mean, um, we, 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 we've broken it down into different stages. So the first stage really focused on, uh, first of all, collecting the data and then using the data to help us with our center linings on the converting line. So we have uh, three converting lines at that facility. We, we, we really uh, used line one as our first line and are rolling it out to line two and three. Uh, the degree of precision that we're able to get on our center lining was able to increase uh, our OEEs beyond our, our uh, planned OEE ramp up, uh, driven uh, because of the uh, benefits that we're getting from AI. Um, and then uh, the next phase, which uh, you know, we're working on now uh, and announcing, will also look more holistically around production planning, um, uh, inventory management, uh, and a couple of other areas of the facility, uh, waste reduction, uh, to, uh, to add further value uh, on the site. So, you know, I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to, if you will, share anything confidential. Uh, I think on a macro basis, we're doing what AI is meant to do, which is take repetitive data and create predictability with it. Uh, and the, 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 the information platform that we have put in to collect the data is state of the art. And now the algorithms that we're using uh, from that data is, uh, is what's going to yield the uh, benefit. And this is, a, this is a journey for us. Uh, certainly, we're putting it in Sherbrooke and rolling it out, but we see this uh, going across our whole supply chain and then into other areas like you know, finance and, and uh, production plan and uh, sales forecasting, et cetera, other areas of our business as well. So this is a, a long-term journey uh, that uh, we'll take in stages because, as you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's expensive investment to make. That's great, color. Thanks. And one last one for me. Uh, given your view of pulp prices moving mostly sideways but potentially downward in the months ahead, weighed against potential supply chain disruptions, how are you managing the pace of investment in your inventories? So um, when COVID hit, we, we ramped up, uh, immediately ramped up our, our production, or sorry, our um, purchases of, of pulp on site. So, you know, we would we ramped them up to three, fourfold what we'd normally carry because we weren't sure what was going to happen in the market. We started easing those up as, as it became clear on the supply chain side. I think now with, uh, you know, with, the, with the refocus on supply chain challenges, uh, we will continue to ramp up, but not to the levels pre-COVID. Uh, as We have not seen any disruptions, nor do we anticipate any disruptions, on the, uh, particularly on the pulp side. Um, despite uh, the fact that you know most of our pulp is, is sourced from Canada or uh, or South America, even the South American uh, uh, pulp is moving uh, well, and we don't we work we're in close contact with our suppliers there. We don't see an issue, but nonetheless, we will ramp up uh, a bit on the raw material side. Um, packaging, we are increasing uh, our inventory there as well, uh, but not again not to the extent that we had uh, during COVID. 
So I would say it's being smart without, uh, you know, uh, investing significant amounts in in building inventory. Uh, unless we hear news, then we'll take action to to build inventory uh, in that particular uh, raw material. That's clear. Thank you very much. I'll turn it over. Here. And there are no further questions at this time. I will turn the call back over to the presenters for closing remarks. Great. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for joining us on this call today. Uh, we do look forward to speaking with you again following the re release of our fourth uh, quarter results. Thank you, and have a great day. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect. Today's customers expect fast, personalized support. Intercom has the tools you need to deliver just that, efficiently, at any scale. Supercharge your team's productivity and make your customers super happy with Intercom. Learn more at intercom.com slash support. At T-Mobile for Business, unconventional thinking means we see things differently so you can focus on what matters most. That's why we've become the leader in 5G, number one in customer satisfaction, and a partner who includes 5G in every plan. So you get it all. Unconventional thinking is better for business. Open Signal awards T-Mobile as America's fastest 5G network USA. 5G user experience report July 2021. Cable device required. Coverage not available in some areas. Some uses may require certain plan or features. See T-Mobile.com. For J.D. Power 2020 award information, visit JDPower.com slash awards. Thank you for listening to TSX Quarterly. If you enjoyed the cast, remember to leave a good rating. And remember, for any additional inquiries, please consult the company's investor relations section on their website. See you next time.